So it's great to be here, Mike. Thank you so much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be with Adam here. So let's start from sort of the beginning. Uh, you were an alumni here, and probably you have been in this room before. How did you got into crypto? Yeah, so can everyone hear me? Is the mic working? No. no. Okay. We're going to trade back and forth. Hey, everyone. So my name's Adam. I'm actually an HBS alum, class of 2013. So I was just back on campus in the spring for my five year, which was ex went much faster than I expected. And I was talking to Marco earlier. I, almost to the day, I was in this room, the iLab had just opened up about six years ago, doing a startup weekend, which at that time is they take a bunch of folks, they lock them together in a room for a weekend, and you're supposed to kind of exit with a startup idea and, and uh, a business plan. And to me, we didn't actually walk out with anything that exciting. I think we actually created uh, a tab that would hold your tie to your shirt, so it wasn't the most innovative thing. But what I did find out is that I absolutely wanted to be in the startup world. I wanted to work in technology. I had no clue what it would be, though. I started kind of exploring asteroid mining. I looked at space tourism. And none of that really captured my attention. But a few weeks after, I discovered Bitcoin. And this is probably the uh, early 2012, that winter spring. And I went down the proverbial rabbit hole of, of crypto and Bitcoin and found it absolutely fascinating. And to me, it challenged not just um, you know, how does this technology work? What is a blockchain? How do you look at consensus for a, uh, a group of untrusted individuals? But just as importantly, what is money? What gives money value? What's the history of money? And as a student, I actually went to a couple of professors for my EC year and tried to write a paper around Bitcoin and was kind of universally told, hey, we don't think Bitcoin's of academic caliber. It's just not something that we, we think we're ready to have students writing about. And, and frankly, I don't think many people heard about it. So now returning back five, six years later, you know, being able to talk with uh, Professor DiMaggio and just seeing the, the turnout today, it's really exciting to see how far this industry's come and what gives me the most hope and kind of uh, enthusiasm that we're going to get through this crypto winter and many more like we have in the past is all the great panelists up here and what they're building. So um, happy to talk a little bit about back today. Okay, great. So let me start by saying I completely disagree with my colleagues. Bitcoin is great. If, if there are students in the room who want to write a paper on Bitcoin, just uh, I will give you my, uh, my card. So why don't we start with um, a little bit telling us why you moved. You were employee number five at Coinbase and probably your move to back is one of the you know, most talked about uh, rumors in the, in the industry. What's going on? So I, I was incredibly fortunate to have a front row seat in, in the development of crypto. And being at Coinbase and working uh, with Brian and Fred um, and a whole group of incredible uh, Coinbase alum. I know Linda's here somewhere today. She's talking in the afternoon. To me, it was, it was that front row seat to, to learn, to, uh, to get to know folks, and really help make an impact. But like most people, when you work at the same job for five years, you start to get this itch that you go, what else is out there? How else can I learn? How else can I grow? And beyond there was never any question in my mind that I wasn't going to stay in the crypto space, but I wanted to work at a different company with a different culture. Um, and I also had this fundamental belief that it was incredibly important for this technology and this industry to be successful, that institutional capital would come into the space. And that's why for a few years at Coinbase, I led our institutional products, which was our exchange, our custodian. Uh, we were exploring a prime broker, as well as all the operations and support and sales that, that goes with that. And, and Coinbase was off to the races. I think we, we assembled an incredibly competent team. And I, in many ways, was needed less and less. Right? I surrounded myself by great folks. And uh, to me, it was, it was the right time, right around year five, the end of my fifth year, to pick my head up and see uh, what's next. So I had all intentions on actually taking about six months or a year off. It, it is a grind working at most startups, as many people in this room know. Routine 15, 16 hours a day in the office on weekends, um, up in the middle of the night when the matching engine breaks and you've got you know, customers calling your personal cell phone. But rather than take six months off, I wound up taking about six days off and, and connected with the ICE and BAC team and was really uh, inspired by the vision of what they were bringing. And what I think to me is what's so important is that ICE has a history of doing, is that they take technology and they bring that to opaque, inefficient, maybe under or unregulated markets and bring that market into the light. They've done it with early on with energy. That's kind of the history of ICE, the uh, Continental Power Exchange. They then did it in uh, 2009, 2010 with credit default swaps. And Jeff Sprecher has this vision that he wants to do the same thing for cryptocurrency, that he believes the genie is out of the bottle. Digital assets are not going away. And it's going to take technology first firms like ICE and this new sub called BACT, which we can talk about, to help bring this market uh, in par and, and in the same uh, light as, as any other asset class that we look at. 
Okay, so why don't we talk about this? Because I was looking online, I was trying to find some flashy announcement about BACT and what you guys were doing, but I didn't find any apart from some blog posts. So what's going on? What are you guys doing there? So we've been intentionally quiet because we haven't shipped a product. So I actually feel awkward sitting up on stage, and maybe this is from five years working with Brian and Fred at Coinbase, which is shipping product and execution matters far more than, than talking about what you're going to do. And BACT hasn't shipped a product yet. But that's for a reason. And I think what we're trying to do is work with regulators and work with industry participants where this asset class and this technology is still very new. And to us, absolutely, we want to be launched tomorrow. We want to have launched yesterday. But we're taking a long-term vision that it's more important to do it right and to bring regulators along with us so that they feel comfortable and they understand our tech stack, they understand the industry, they understand and feel comfortable with the regulatory structure they're providing, such that once BAC does this, we're effectively, in many ways, I think, going to set precedent, precedent for a lot of other companies to go out there and do something similar. And it's our, it's our impression and it's our hope that we are not the only one playing in the institutional space. We are not the only company building applications and utility on crypto, um, specifically public blockchains. We want to see a, a lot of folks do that. The pie is way too small right now for back to be worried about how do we compete with competitor X or competitor Y. We want to grow the entire pie to, to all be successful. So taking a step back, I think we focus most largely on, on what back's doing on the institutional side. And that's very simply a physically delivered future, uh, which means that rather than look to a, an index price, which is what CME and SIBO are doing, you actually see physical delivery. And that looks a lot like the cash markets, like what Coinbase and Gemini and Kraken and, and all the other uh, crypto exchanges already do. When I give you dollars or euros or yen in return, I get crypto. And that involves uh, a centralized custodian. So from the ground up, BACT has built their own custodial solution. And I kind of joke that you know, my first day in, in the seat, I was worried that I kind of sit down, I, I get my desk, and someone says, oh, by the way, those Bitcoin private keys are in your office desk drawer. Make sure you lock it up on the way out. And I said, if that's what I'm stepping into, it, it is so important that I take the years of experience and, and uh, uh, knowledge that I have from Coinbase and help kind of bring that to this, to this company. Because like it or not, BACT and other institutions are going to move into this space. And I feel personally compelled to help make sure that happens in, in a, a safe way. I was very happy to realize that was absolutely not the case. BACT had built an incredibly uh, sophisticated and, and uh, I would say very elegant solution for storing Bitcoin in a way that we can also support other public blockchains as well and add more assets. So we're starting with Bitcoin because quite simply, that's the only digital asset that we've seen the CFTC come out and say it is definitively a commodity. Uh, there are many other digital assets out there and, and that's why we have uh, an open comment period going on right now for Ethereum as the CFTC saying, we want to hear how do people think about Ether and, and the network. But it's absolutely our intention to add custody and trading for more digital assets. But we also want to help build utility and application on those, on those technologies as well. So sharing a quick ICE story that may help put this into light. When ICE develops a new market, um, say it's for like an oil future, they don't do so by building that market around the speculator or the trader. They really build it around the commercial user. So the example I like to use is there's a factory that produces a widget, and that's how they make revenue and sustain their business. In order pr to produce that widget, they rely on oil, and they kind of have one dedicated oil supplier or pipeline. If that pipeline goes offline, they stop producing widgets and they go out of business. So many of these companies manage their risk by buying a future on that uh, pipeline. So if it does go offline, they've hedged out their risk. That's exactly how Bax looked at providing a marketplace for Bitcoin. And that's why we started with saying, we're going to allow you to take your Bitcoin and go buy cups of coffee at Starbucks. Do we believe we are going to see billions and billions of dollars of Bitcoin paid for Starbucks coffee? Most likely not. It's our hope that that happens over time. But from day one, I, I think we're realists. And we, of course, know it's going to be a, a gradual um, increase. But we do want to actually think about creating a market and uh, that drives users to use their crypto in a way that provides a more healthy, heterogeneous market for those market makers and, and speculators to trade on. And so can you drill down a little bit on the challenges that you are facing now in building this sort of system around uh, what you guys are, are going to do? Uh, although, you, you know, I know that you don't want to get into the specifics of the products, but what are really the challenges of sort of building this from the ground up? I would probably largely bucket the, the challenges into three, and some are no more unique for us than they are for anyone else building a business in the room. 
Uh, so one is actually just hiring and creating a culture where people show up to work and want to be there, and you can attract great talent, and, and people do their best work. Again, kind of looking back to my time at Coinbase, and I'd say before that in the Air Force, that, that's a core part of, of how you build a successful team in my mind. If you have a mission uh, and a vision that inspires people to show up to work every day and, and to pull the all-nighters when they need to, you treat them well and, and you have uh, uh, great folks that um, kind of learn and grow and, and work alongside each other. So that, just like any business, Backed is a small, call it 12-person company. We're pulling from a larger family of ICE employees, probably upwards of 100. But we're still small and scrappy and, and feel the same challenge as anyone else does. The second one, I would say, goes to the regulator uh, side of things. We, we are very clearly you know, working to be a regulated entity. We think that's core to building a successful, healthy marketplace and for bringing in institutional capital. Do we expect that wave of institutional capital to hit day one we, when we launch? Absolutely not. But we do firmly have a thesis that that will come over time, like, like we've seen it for other asset classes. Um, and the third one is actually just shipping product. It's the technology. It's how do you, when you are a centralized custodian, security has to be at the forefront of every decision we make. And when we want to ship product and move quickly, we are not in an environment where you can move fast and break things. You have to build products with that security first mindset, but you have to move quickly enough and add features and functionality that makes you relevant and are actually solving uh, you know, customers' needs at the end of the day. And so you're talking about all the good side of working within ICE. Uh, and if I think about you, I think about Axoni, for example, and some of other applications. Uh, it's also weird if you compare this type of um, uh, disruptors with disruptors in other sort of uh, sub-segment of the fintech space, uh, because the disruptors sort of want to get rid of the incumbents, while it seems that like you guys are working hand-to-hand -hand with uh, with incumbents. Are there, you know, is that what you expect is the natural way and the only way to make an innovation in this market? Is that the, you know, something that you have to sort of you know, just face? Is that something that has only upside? I don't believe so. But I, I like I think many others, um, recognize we are the early pioneers. We're the early innings of, of this movement of creating the internet of value. And if what BACT approaches this world in is it's a winner take all. We want to be everything to everyone. We're, one, we're not going to succeed. And two, the industry is not going to be successful. So what's been great is when I was at Coinbase, I kind of spent less and less of my time talking and thinking about crypto and spent more and more of my time educating and advocating for how does institutional capital look at the space? What's the regulatory environment? What are trading and markets and liquidity and, and all the things that come along with kind of moving into that world? By moving over to BACT, I spend almost none, none of my time now talking about that. I'm surrounded by 5,000 other employees at ICE that have spent their careers doing that. So I get to spend all my time talking about crypto, looking at where protocols are headed, what's interesting, what's not, and also looking across the landscape of, of new companies emerging, what they're building, and how we could potentially support or partner with that to, to make it successful. So this is one, like in many things in financial services, you hear the term uh, co-opetition. There's this, yeah, everyone knows they're, they're kind of competitors, but one bank knows they can't be successful without that other bank as well. So I think we look at that not just at the institutional trading and markets level, but also with the uh, upstart you know, application and even protocol development teams that are working in crypto. Okay, so before opening up to the questions from the audience, why don't um, we sort of drill down on the last thing that you said in terms of what are the trends that you believe are uh, the successful ones, things that you are excited about within or outside backed? What are the things that you feel like this is hype and this is not really going to happen or this is not really the, the way you know, we should do things here? That's a tricky question. So I, I will start with on the positive side, like a trend that I'm personally inspired by and I think... Um, more and more folks at, at ICE and BACT are too, if I can speak for them, is I'd say call it general tokenization. So it's this idea that more and more things in, in the world, be it physical assets or commodities, like uh, a piece of gold or a barrel of oil or anything, uh, a piece of real estate can be tokenized, but also inherently digital things as well. So non-fungible tokens like uh, a playing card uh, for an online game or even a security. To me, the, the big trend here is not... Is it stable coins or digital dollars, uh, digital sovereign currencies that are going to you know, totally uh, be the winner? Or is it security tokens? Or is it uh, what Venezuela did by kind of circumventing the modern financial system and, and putting a barrel of oil uh, 
on you know a, a digital token. To me, it's that general trend that that we're seeing these networks develop that allow the more free form transfer and, and ownership of uh, real and digital assets. So that that's personally a trend that. I spend a lot of time thinking about and uh, still learning uh, more and more every day. A trend that I would, I would say is uh, maybe not one that I'm as bullish on is much trickier. Um, I'm hesitant to answer that because it kind of implies that I have some level of understanding or knowledge about what's happening that, that others don't. I would certainly say, you know, I've been sitting in the back of the room since this morning and, and caught the, the last couple of panels. I can't even keep up to speed on what's happening anymore. Like I'm on the block every day, I'm on Coindesk, I'm reading all the newsletters and listening to podcasts, and I could just spend my entire day trying to keep up on the, the pace of innovation and development, and it would be impossible. So it, to me, I don't think there's one trend that stands out that I'm, I'm not optimistic on. Um, there's just ones that tend to rise a little bit higher, and I'd say that's more in the tokenization footprint. Okay, so first question, yeah. We've heard a lot about the Bitcoin futures potentially in fact. Uh, can you speak to uh, the roadmap? Um, maybe something with respect to other digital assets like Ether? Yeah, so the, the question that those didn't hear for the first part is, you know, Bact has come out and said, we're going to launch a physically delivered Bitcoin future. What about the other, other hundreds of digital assets out there? Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. That we do not look at this as a, a Bitcoin only uh, ecosystem. But all these assets are not going to be able to be launched in a regulatory compliant way from day one into the US. So I think we're taking an approach that while BACT may be um, growing and, and call it headquartered in the United States right now, we're going to look to expand internationally to other markets, Europe and Asia. And in those markets, uh, we may have more flexibility to add assets sooner than we do into the US. So yeah, ab absolutely, you will see more digital assets uh, launched on, on BACT. You will also see different types of contracts launched as well, and you'll see that in, in other jurisdictions than just North America. Um, so I think a lot of people in this room are aware that probably I think November or October last year, Cebo and Cbot launched uh, Bitcoin futures, right? So from a purely product product perspective, how do you see um, back different than Cebo and Cbot, and I mean from an exchange perspective, you guys are um, competitors to a certain degree, right? Not exactly competitors because you trade different products. But um, that's my first question. And my second question is, um, I think you also mentioned that when Ice, the parent company, builds uh, products, it doesn't only build the trade trading products, also build an ecosystem around it, right? And build trying to build utilities. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the product roadmap in terms of from that aspect as well? Thanks. So I'll answer the first question first, which is CME and, and CBOE uh, launched uh, Bitcoin futures a little over a year ago. So it was actually, I think, November and December of 2017. Um, how are we different? The, the very simple answer is we are a physically delivered product where CME and CBO are cash settled products. And what that means is on our platform, when someone trades to purchase Bitcoin in the future, at the end of that uh, expiry of that contract, we actually give them Bitcoin. Not us, but the counterparty to that trade. CME and CBO, those, that means it's only cash settled. So they're looking to the cash exchanges, the cash markets like Coinbase and Gemini and, and Ipit and others. And they're saying, let's look at the trading uh, data from there, and we're going to create an index that's going to representatively settle that contract. To us, I think that has kept out some institutional capital. In a way, though, it's actually brought in others. So there's some firms out there that say, we'd actually really want to have asset exposure. We want to have upside potential to this asset class, but we don't want to own it. It's just not within our risk tolerance. Those cash settle products work pretty well. Others, though, say, hey, look, we don't actually want to rely on the cash exchanges, which are, are not regulated exchanges. Some are regulated custodians and money transmitters, but they're not an exchange with a capital E, whereas ICE Futures and the, pro the product back will be offering will be. So our physically delivered product kind of solves that. So backed is air-gapped from the cash markets. The second question is, um, on the application or utility side, what, what are we working on? I won't answer that specifically. I, I will say, though, that on the investment and trading and custody side, it's follow the ICE playbook. And it's uh, be very execution oriented and don't make any mistakes. It's, it's a well-known path to kind of launching products there. On the application and utility side, we have to have a humbleness about ourselves that we're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to innovate. And we're going to experiment and try again. So you're probably going to see part of that continue to launch new products, wind them down, try something else. We're going to be much more innovative and open-minded. Whereas on another side, the institutional side, it's going to be much more kind of 
uh, you know, follow the, the path and, and execute. Have you? I have the next question right here. So, have you thought about implementing like this futures contract as a Bitcoin-based smart contract? So, I haven't thought about that. Uh, what what would that look like? Uh, well, of course, you could just code arbitrary logic into a smart contract, right? So. Um, Let's take a swap, for example. You could just post the collateral to the swap. You'd have an oracle that would provide the uh, data feed for settlement uh, whenever one party wants to settle. So, I mean, there's been a number of people who have experimented with derivatives in smart contracts. So that's why I was bringing up the question. Got it. So, so kind of, kind of like a, a time lock where someone would put up funds and at the end of that end time lock, the funds would be released to the counterparty. The, the honest answer is no. I think where we're at right now is trying to make crypto and Bitcoin specifically look and feel like any other contract that institutions are trading. So when we meet with clients, when we meet with regulators, we always start with cotton. Just assume this is cotton. Here's how this fits into our existing market structure, just like cotton. I think one day, though, I hope we get there, and that's where I'm very excited around the like kind of open finance or decentralized finance, because I do think there's probably firms out there that are better positioned to kind of push those products first, uh, more so than we are. So what we're trying to do at Bact is lean into our strengths, which is institutional products that are highly regulated and that kind of fit and feel like any other product. That's where we're going to start, but we certainly would love to get there one day. Um, so we're all talking about institutional money uh, coming into the market, and that's one of the key promise a product like BART is bringing. So I'm wondering, amongst the, the institutional investors, we also know they are very different from each other, right? So maybe without uh, mentioning the names, what type of institutional uh, investors do you see the most interest? Who do you expect to come into the market first? It's a good question, and we spend a lot of time at back thinking about how do we prioritize our, our sales strategy, because all, all clients are not created equal. Um, I would say, certainly, I, I think where we're going to see a lot of the most uptake early on are from the crypto hedge funds. They're already trading this product. Many of them kind of do uh, riskless arbitrage. What they're looking for is that price delta between different markets for a fungible product. So it's our hope that, that we'll have pretty good engagement and onboard those customers. The challenge is many of those crypto hedge funds are not trading regulated futures products. So you have to kind of get them into and onboarded through the system. I would say there's the largely existing, more traditional institutional traders. So asset managers, proprietary uh, trading firms, and kind of traditional hedge funds. Many of those firms are already trading uh, institutional-based futures. Maybe crypto is something they're already trading as well in the cash market. I think we'll see pretty good uptake, and, and they're already knowledgeable of the regulatory structure. And then there's the long tail of um, existing incumbent institutional uh, services. So it could be sovereign wealth funds. It could be more traditional asset managers, pension funds. That is absolutely our hope to unlock that capital, but that is not going to happen day one. It's probably not going to happen year one. It's going to happen over the next couple of years, and it's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of putting our heads down and just educating and advocating and answering questions over and over. But I think we are optimistic that slowly but surely we will see that, that kind of third bucket come in too. So Adam, I think you know clearly one of the trends going back to Professor DiMaggio's question, uh, not only at today's panel but everywhere else is this notion of institutional money coming into crypto uh, or Bitcoin specifically. Just given your experience at Coinbase and now at BAC, can you talk a little bit about what really is different between a institutional product versus a retail? Is it just simply name brand or are there other things uh, along with it? It's, it's a fair question. And, and for better or for worse, institutions do not make their purchasing decisions based solely on the technology. Technology needs to be a threshold level where they say, OK, your matching engine's not going to fall over. I trust that you're safely storing my crypto. I know I can pick up, and call a, uh, pick up a phone and call someone if, if something breaks. But there also, for better or for worse, is an, an element of trust and reputation and previous engagement. So what's so powerful about launching the, the physically delivered uh, Bitcoin future with BACT is that BACT is not creating a new exchange. All we're really doing is creating a digital asset custodian that has an internal ledger such that ICE Futures US, one of the, the largest derivative exchanges in the world, can immediately spin up and launch a new contract. And all those customers that are already trading everything else on ICE Futures, one day just see a brand new contract ticker code show up. There's no new technical integration. There's no new, uh, there's very limited onboarding. So for us, it's that ease of use, but also 
hey, ICE, we already trade a whole bunch of other products on you, um, and we trust that. I, I do think that's meaningful, and that helps. Hi. Uh, just building on that comment, um, what I'm really thinking about is for ICE, is ICE actually acting as a CCP in this situation? And if so, are you leveraging the same type of FCM model and default waterfall? And if you are, would you actually accept crypto as part of that default waterfall contribution from the clearing members? It's a good question. And we are absolutely using ICE Futures US and ICE Clear US, the clearing house and, and the, the exchange that powers all the products. Um, I can't speak specifically yet to how we're doing the waterfall, the guarantee fund, skin in the game, but we are, we are leveraging the existing ICE infrastructure and regulatory licenses to offer this product. This is probably why you're seeing it take longer than hopefully many people in this room, myself included, would like to see for this product to come to market because we're not building something brand new from the ground up and kind of walling it off and separating it. We're instead trying to say, how do we integrate and support this just like ICE would for any other product? So we are absolutely using the same model where FCMs act as the, those are the futures commissions merchants. They're kind of like the brokers of the securities world. They're actually onboarding the individual traders. And then ICE Futures and ICE Clear has a relationship with the FCMs to kind of manage intraday margin, variation margin for, for the products. That's exactly what we're doing. Other questions? So if you're physically settled, how do you figure out intraday margins? Because wouldn't that rely on some sort of pricing of the asset? So like, would you then end up just needing to go back to that situation where you have to come up with a price index? So we do have to come up with a risk model. And the risk model effectively says, how much variation margin do we require of customers to put up based on the volatility of this product? That is going to be um, some element of, of looking at the cash markets. And we would not have backed and we would not have CME and, and SIBO products if it wasn't for the cash markets. They play an incredibly important role. This space never gets big enough or important enough to actually register on, on Jeff Sprecher's you know, desk one day and for him to say, let's actually uh, you know, go out and build, build this to bring this uh, asset class um, even more uh, mainstream. So yeah, so what, what ICE does is they take uh, market data from that market data, they kind of sanitize it, they build a risk model from it, and that risk model is what goes in front of regulators and customers and says, here's why we're willing to give X amount of leverage for this product and how you have to kind of continuously top up based on that day's movement. That product itself, though, that price, once it's trading, is only looked at within the backed physically delivered future. So we're looking at our market data, but the way in which we create that model to launch on day one absolutely is looking at other exchanges. One last question. Given that you guys are working with a lot of regulators, uh, certainly with ICE being an international exchange, what, are, what is the number one question that the regulators across the globe is pushing back on what, what is going on? Because no one seems to be accepting uh, crypto as a, as a genuine commodity at the moment, apart from uh, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin. So the number one question I think stems from, for better or for worse, Bitcoin's reputational debt is that there's still so many preconceived notions around how people use Bitcoin, that it's only used in dark net markets and that it's this um, you know, bad person's uh, you know, money transfer network. So by far the number one question we get from regulators that we always start with is compliance. How do you actually understand the provenance of Bitcoin moving in and then moving out? Um, how do you understand your customers and what they're doing with it? So a lot of the work I've done early on at BACT is help us design a compliance program from the ground up that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work and understanding kind of blockchain analytics and customer profiles and going, hey, if you look at any Bitcoin, it's almost tainted in, in some uh, level. Just like almost any dollar bill in anyone's wallet is probably used for something that's been nefarious. So we have to work with regulators to say, look, it's not the number of hops that matters. If it was 100 hops ago or 1,000 hops ago on the network, you saw someone potentially move it to an offshore exchange or use it to something that, that was unknown. What you have to look at is the intention and a bunch of other factors. So a lot of the IP, a lot of the kind of, I think, unique um, stuff that BAC's working on is how do you create a compliance program that gets regulators as well as banking partners and institutional clients comfortable trading this asset? I have a burning question. How is it to work for a husband-wife team? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I mean, it's it's very candidly, um, I'd, got to, I'd gotten to know the ICE team over the years. Uh, what most people don't know is the New York Stock Exchange, which is owned by ICE, Intercontinental Exchange, invested in Coinbase's Series C back in January of 2015. So there were a whole bunch of times I called up Mayor Kapani, the CTO of ICE, and said, how do we scale our matching engine, right? Our volumes are growing and we're starting to really feel the pain. So I always looked at them as part of the family and, and got to know them. So when I left and there was an opportunity to come work for them, uh, it, 
you know, it was, it was hard to turn down. I think they are truly visionaries in the space. And what, what's really enjoyable about working for Kelly is, is she's really digging in and understands cryptocurrency. It is not this, hey, we're going to try a bet here. And if it doesn't play out in a couple of years, well, we gave it a shot. Uh, she is reading the white papers and attending meetups and digging in at, at the foundational level to understand this technology. So she has an informed point of view on where things are headed. And you look at Jeff, who brings 20-some years of experience building institutional markets, engaging with regulators, understanding how to bridge that new emerging asset class thing into kind of the, the light of US regulation. So together, I think they make a, a fantastic pair. And I, I feel very lucky to work with them. Great. Uh, well, that was an awesome panel. Everyone, a round of applause for Marco and Adam. Thanks.